Good morning. Glad you're back here with us. Glad that you have found your way here to YouTube where we can continue to study God's Word together. Uh, it is a, you know, a, a unique thing. I've talked to people and a lot of people have said, you know, Mike, sometimes I don't have time on a Sunday morning. So they're watching the sermons on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and uh, sometimes they catch up, sometimes they fall behind. But I find this to be interesting because that means that we're sort of doing this, gathering together like this, uh, throughout the week, in a sense. And that's okay, too. You know, whenever you get a chance and, you know, can get back uh, on uh, the, the subject of Titus, uh, that's going to be a good thing. So glad you're here. Glad we could be here together. Glad we have God's Word to guide us and lead us. It is always the anchor that we need in life. The, the sustaining, you know, grounding thing that we have that can keep us going. And we learn from Paul's letters and we learn from Jesus' words, we learn from every single writer of the, the New Testament that God can be trusted, that his word is our foundation. So thank you for uh, making that a priority, whatever day this is that you have found your way here. Our series is on Titus. This, of course, is Paul's letter to Titus. He has written this to help this young minister, this young evangelist, to strengthen the churches, to establish the churches. And last week, we talked about how Titus' main function, main job there, was to establish, appoint elders, make sure elders are appointed in each church, uh, so that they can have the leadership of people who are trustworthy. And uh, this week, I want to begin there, because verse 9 of Titus 1 gives us insight into what the rest of the chapter is going to say. This is talking about elders. He says, he must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught so that he may be able to give instruction in sound doctrine and also to rebuke those who contradict it. Last time, if you remember, elders were given the, you know, first of all, what elders must not be, or what must be, must not be, and then what elders must do. And with what the elders must do, there were those three things that we looked at, and they all centered around God's word. These are supposed to be men of God's word. And so when we look at this here, he says, look, you're, you're supposed to be able to give instruction, but also... You're supposed to be able to rebuke those who contradict it, those who are going against God's word, those who are, are teaching something or living some way that contradicts the truth that you find there. And so that's kind of what then Paul moves into as he goes to verse 10 and then to the end of the chapter, sort of that category of people who are contradicting God's word, kind of the people who already should be on the list of these elders, the people they're going to need to talk to, people they're going to need to open their Bibles with and instruct. So take a look at uh, verse 10. For there are many who are insubordinate, empty talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision party. They must be silenced, since they are upsetting whole families by teaching for shameful gain what they ought not to teach. One of the Cretans, a prophet of their own, said, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. This testimony is true. Now, just a side point here. It's an interesting thing. Paul quotes the, uh, the, the poet Epimenides here. And Epimenides has a very low idea of Crete, even though he's from Crete. He's like, yeah, this is what Cretans are like. Oh, they're, they're, they're gluttons, they're evil beasts, they're lazy. And, um, and, and Paul interestingly says, aha, and that's true. So you have Cretans always lie, and then a Cretan says they always lie. And he says, but that's true, which is amazingly paradoxical, right? But uh, Paul's basically saying, look, Crete has problems. And the, the problems of the island of Crete are, are not going to just magically stay away uh, from your churches that you're working with, Titus. And so you're going to have to deal with this. He's going to have to deal with trouble on Crete. And he is supposed to be sort of enlisting the help of elders to you know, help him to to be you know the, the a guiding force here. So it's not just Titus alone, but he's saying, look, you, you've got to prepare the churches so that the leadership of the churches can be dealing with these issues. So what's going on here? Who are these people, and what are they doing? Well, first of all, these folks are insubordinate, which means they are not under any rule. They're rebellious. This is the exact same word that Paul uses only a few verses before to talk about how. Elders' children must not be this. They must not be, you know, insubordinate, wild, rebellious. Okay, so that's, that's that same word. And Paul is saying there's people like this 
who are out there causing trouble, uh, not just for the island generally, but for the churches as well. These folks are full of empty, deceptive talk. Uh, empty words are, you know, interesting because it, it, that means that the, the empty words catch people's attention, but they're meaningless. And so even though they are talking a lot and maybe even gaining a hearing, it is not any kind of words that build up the church. These are empty words. These are meaningless words. Uh, and in most cases, then, they're going to be harmful words because it's steering people away from the truth. They're teaching legalism. Now, again, this is a battle that Paul has been fighting his entire apostolic ministry. That there are those out there who are saying, whoa, whoa, you can't just walk right into this kingdom. You have to first, if you're a Gentile, you have to first be circumcised. You have to first follow all these dietary laws. You have to follow A, B, C, D, E, F, G. And once you get all those done, well then, okay, then you can consider yourself to be a Christian. Now, the next thing Paul says here is that they're upsetting whole families, and these ideas are all tied together. So I want you to picture this, this scene, right? So you have these people who are empty talkers. They're insubordinate. They think they know everything. They're not under anybody's authority. They're not really under the, even the apostles' authority. Uh, but they're coming in there, they're teaching. And what are they teaching? They're, they're walking into a church saying, you think that you're a Christian? You think that you are actually you know, saved in Christ? But you're not even circumcised. You're not even a person of, of the law. You're, you're not even, you know, you, you're throwing out, you know, God's law. Don't you know about the Old Testament scriptures? And so the people who thought that they were perfectly, you know, in Christ, that they had the status of being in God's family, all of a sudden these empty talkers come and they're beginning to drive a wedge. They're trying to cause people to doubt their very salvation. So it's not just upsetting generally, but when you, you look at it, you say, they're not just, you know, oh, oh, saying something about somebody's grandmother. No, no, no. They are actually causing people to be worried about their own salvation because of their legal requirements they're putting on people. They are teaching what they're teaching. It is false teaching, but they're teaching it for gain. Uh, I often will say this, and, you know, it, it's continually true. False teachers do not call themselves false teachers, all right? They simply call themselves teachers. They think they're doing the church a great service. Paul says, look, they're, they're false teachers. But more than that, they are doing this for gain. And this is a battle that he fights in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 5, and then Peter himself battles in 2 Peter chapter 2. In both of these cases, false teachers are not just teaching, but they're also expecting support. They're, they're taking money as itinerant preachers, and they're preaching false things, and they're collecting money for it. And Paul, throughout his ministry, keeps underscoring the idea he does not operate that way. So Paul is distinct from these guys when he says, for example, in 2 Corinthians 11, verses 7 and 8, Or did I commit a sin in humbling myself so that you might be exalted, because I preach God's gospel to you free of charge. I robbed other churches by accepting support from them in order to serve you. So to the Corinthians, Paul is saying, look, when I was preaching with you, I didn't accept a dime. There's other guys around, around me, you know, these false teachers, who just have their hand out the whole time. And they're very eloquent speakers, and to hear them was to love them. Paul didn't have that kind of reputation. Paul, you know, shared Christ, but he didn't share it in these amazing wise words and then pass the hat as if, you know, you, you now just in hearing me should be ready to throw money at my feet. These other guys seemed to be like that. They were puffed up. They were, And so Paul says, I didn't do any of that among you. I did not combine the teaching of the gospel with a service charge. And so he's saying, look, I, I preach the gospel to you free of charge. Are you going to hold that against me because of my humility? Because I was not, you know, stuffy enough that I, I would demand payment from you? So these folks on Crete are in the same vein. They are demanding payment. They're, they're preaching for gain. Same thing that he addresses in other places and Peter does as well. And so what do we do here? Paul gives a very clear answer to the problem that's going on on Crete. Take a look, in uh, starting in verse 13. Therefore, rebuke them sharply. 
that they may be sound in the faith, not devoting themselves to Jewish myths and the commands of people who turn away from the truth. To the pure, all things are pure, but to the defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure, but both their minds and their consciences are defiled. They profess to know God, but they deny him by their works. They are detestable, disobedient, unfit for any good work. So Paul, when he's looking at this situation, says this is not the time to just sort of wait and see what happens. This is not the time to just sort of say, ah, you know, it might blow over. It might not be that big of a deal. He says, no, there is a necessary response needed here. And that response is correction. Correction. It is time for you, Titus, and for the elders there on Crete that you're going to be appointing to deal with this as an issue, to help people go from where they are to where they need to be. Because if you don't, they're going to infect the church. They're going to affect other way, people's way of thinking. And that's not going to be healthy for the church. It's got to be dealt with. So what does he say? Well, first of all, they must be silenced. Now, this is one of those moments where the Greek is a little bit more graphic than we might you know, be okay with or, or, or you know, expecting here. Uh, because the literal word in Greek is they must be muzzled. So that's like, eh, that's a bit more extreme language than we would use, but it's not totally out of character. I mean, there's times when Paul calls his opponents, for example, in Philippians chapter 3, he calls them dogs. So, you know, he says, look, these guys on Crete, they need to be muzzled. They need to be put under control. But here's the deal. Uh, in Paul's day, that word had already, you know, sort of just expanded to the idea of, you know, not by force, not by an actual muzzle, uh, of course, but by truth and reason silence these people. So make arguments, persuade them, in other words, correct them, help them to see that what they are teaching is harmful, what they're teaching is off base, it's, it's offline from what Christ would want, and they're to rebuke them sharply. Now, I see a difference between the word correction and the word rebuke in the Bible, and I usually think of it this way. Correction is usually in helping somebody's thinking, helping their understanding, uh, so that what they say is more correct, more accurate. Whereas rebuke is more dealing with somebody's actions uh, or, or thinking that then leads to action very quickly. So it has a, a more of a stopping somebody's action aspect to it. But both are necessary here on the island of Crete. There are some goals here. And he only hints at it, really. He doesn't go into too much on, on that idea. But he says you know, that they may be sound in the faith. Uh, to the pure, all things are pure. You know, they profess to know God, but right now they're unfit for good works. There is a goal in the correction that Paul is calling for here. And the goal can be broken down like this. He wants these folks to be sound in the faith. All right, so that's the positive spin. You know, that right now they're not sound in the faith. They're not solid in the understanding of the teachings of the church. And, and how, you know, of course, we're throwing out legalism and whatnot, but Paul wants them to be sound in the faith. Paul wants the correction to bring them to the point that their hearts will be pure rather than defiled and unbelieving. He doesn't sort of use language that says they're too far gone, they're already in the category of defiled and unbelieving, so forget about it. It's more like, with some correction, they can be brought from one category to the other. They can be brought from rebellious to then being under God's rule. They can be brought from defiled and unbelieving to now having a stronger faith and to be pure. That's the goal here. He wants the correction to come that their profession of faith in God can be genuine. Right now, they, they're using their mouth to profess God, but their lives, their works don't match up. Paul says with some correction, with you, know, you stepping in, interceding here, silencing what they're saying, and then helping them to understand, what will happen then is that their profession of faith in God, what they say will match how they live. And so it'll be a real profession. It won't just be words only, but it'll be words backed up with their righteous life in Christ. And then finally, he wants this correction to come that they might be fit for good works. You're going to find in the book of Titus, that every once in a while, good works comes up. 
And it, sometimes it'll come up to say, hey, look, you know, we weren't, are not saved based on our good works. But other times it says we are saved so that we can, in, you know, we can just dive right into the good works that God has prepared for us. Well, the people in this category... They could, they could, you know, do good works you know, all day long. The problem is it's not matching up with their life. They are unfit for the good works because of these, this false teaching and you know, their, their attitudes of greed and whatnot. And so correction here has a specific goal. It wants to bring total harmony back to a church that otherwise might be busted up by the false teaching that these folks are bringing. And so when we look at the situation on Crete, the first thing we might be tempted to say is, ah, you know, that's interesting. It's interesting that Crete had problems, that Paul is calling for action here with Titus and others. Uh, but it's so different. And that is an important distinction. The specifics of what's going on in Crete are not necessarily the specifics of what are going on in the church of today. You know, the, the, our congregation or the churches. In the United States in uh, 2020. But the way I want to think about this is, look, what we get here and what we get in other parts of Scripture is a solid way of understanding correction as a blessing. And that's sort of like my big theme for this week. We almost never think of correction as a positive, right? Uh, as something that is positive, positive for us to receive, but also positive for us to know how to do right. Uh, to do in a, a way that honors God and honors the person that we're trying to correct. So what I wanted to do as our action steps today is to just go through and say, okay, look, this is how you correct someone else. We never talk about it this way. We, we, we think to ourselves, okay, if something does need to be corrected, I shouldn't be the one to do it because who am I? I've got all of my problems. I've got my own personal sin that I struggle with. I can't correct anybody else. And we sometimes think that way. And, and we think that, you know, like, a, like imagine a doctor who is overweight. And, and the doctor comes in the office and the thing he needs to say to me is, Mike, you've got to lose some weight. But because he has his own weight issues, he doesn't tell me the truth. He doesn't correct, you know, the fact that I eat too many cheeseburgers and don't exercise enough. No, no, no. It is his role, his job to say that to me, even if he has the same struggles. Same is going on here. In the Bible, over and over again, it talks about instruction, correction, and even being rebuked as blessings from God. And blessings from God through the voice of others. So I want to look at today, how do we do it? And how do we do it right? So what I've done is sort of given a list of questions, five questions to ask yourself as you are moving into the the moment where correction is necessary, where correction will be a good thing. Question number one, is the error so serious that the good of the correction outweighs the embarrassment of the correction? This is a crucial first question because if you start to think about it and you say to yourself, you know, the error is not all that serious. It's a typo. Uh, it's just a misprint or it's just a, you know, a one word thing that was wrong. He, he said, you know, uh, Benedict Cumberhatch instead of Benedict Cumberbatch. And if you correct him, you know, it, it, is it really that serious? No, it's not that serious. And so you ask yourself, is it that serious? And the reason is because every correction from one adult to another is going to involve embarrassment. That's just how we're made. That's how we're built. Because as soon as I say something or do something, but then I get corrected on it, there's a chance that I'm going to take that as, oh my goodness, you know, th this person doesn't, you know, doesn't think that I can communicate. This person doesn't agree with me. This person, you know, is against me somehow. So all those fears can crop up. And embarrassment does that. It, it sort of triggers all those defenses that are natural with us. And so you have to say, does the good of the correction outweigh the possible embarrassment? Question number two, is there any reason this correction cannot occur privately? Now, what I'm basically setting up here is the fact that any correction should happen one-on-one -on -one or at least privately. 
And the idea here being, look, that's the default. That's how it usually should be. That almost always, I'm talking 99.999% of the time, anytime correction is involved, it should be private. I mean, the embarrassment factor will be reduced dramatically if you're in private. If it's just the two of you in a conversation, if it's just the two of you over you know, a, a message on the computer, and you're keeping it civil and you're keeping it private, the odds of somebody having all the negatives that come from embarrassment are drastically reduced when it's said in private. When I'm working with couples on, you know, before they get married, this is one of the things I really try to emphasize. And I say, look, when the two of you are struggling, when you're fighting, keep it between the two of you and keep it private. Don't have an outburst when you and all of your friends are at Eaton Park. That's not going to do anybody any good. You're going to get defensive. She's going to get defensive. He's going to get defensive. You know, it's all going to be bad. Don't go running to, you know, your, your mom and dad when there's a problem because that's not private. You've now gone to another person. The correction is best done privately. So, for example, Acts chapter 18. Here's a situation where the correction goes very well privately. Now a Jew named Apollos, a native of Alexandria, came to Ephesus. He was an eloquent man, competent in the scriptures. He had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in spirit, he spoke and taught accurately the things concerning Jesus, though he knew only the baptism of John. He began to speak boldly in the synagogue, but when Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. And when he wished to cross to Achaia, the brothers encouraged him and wrote to the disciples to welcome him. Here's a fantastic example, Priscilla and Aquila. They're there in the crowd. They hear the teaching from Apollos, and they have a, a, an option there. They have some options. They can stand up and start telling him that he's wrong. They can uh, you know, gather some of their friends together and go to him afterward and be like, no, 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 you don't know what you're talking about here. But the third option, the best option in this case, was that they take him aside and speak to him in a way where he doesn't get defensive. You know, he doesn't think that everybody's out to get him, that, that they're only for Paul and not for Apollos or something silly like that, like it's going on in Corinth. And so it goes well. He, he becomes a, a teacher who know, now has the full story, including the Holy Spirit and all the rest that happened in the beginning of the, the book of Acts. So they're able to relate that to him. He, they correct him. He's now going to be preaching more accurately, and the church is better for it. And so, if it can be done privately, it should be done privately. The blessing of correction should almost always come privately. However, there are times in the church where a public correction is also necessary and also good. So, for example, in uh, Galatians chapter 2, Paul's talking about what happens in Antioch. This is uh, starting in verse 11. But when Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face, because he stood condemned. For before certain men came from James, he was eating with the Gentiles. But when they came, he drew back and separated himself, fearing the circumcision party. And the rest of the Jews acted hypocritically along with him, so that even Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. But when I saw that their conduct was not in step with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas before them all, If you, though a Jew, live like a Gentile and not like a Jew, how can you force the Gentiles to live like Jews? So Paul sees the acts of Peter and some of the others as being so hypocritical and publicly hypocritical, damaging to the gospel that he's been preaching to the Gentiles, that he says it's unavoidable. It needs to be addressed publicly. I've got to stand up for my brothers and sisters in Christ who are right here watching this hypocrisy. I can't just take Peter aside privately and, and get Peter on board, and then Peter can go on his merry way to Jerusalem. That won't do these brothers and sisters any good who have seen him you know, sort of act like they're now pariahs when other people come from Jerusalem. So Paul says, I wish I could do it privately, but no, I had to do it in front of everybody because his, his error was that serious. It required that it be addressed publicly. 
The third question to ask, what Bible passages will I bring into the conversation? Between two Christians, this has to be a factor. And if I'm about to correct somebody, I better have already opened God's Word to determine exactly where in that scripture this person has gone into error. You understand what I mean? Because if I don't, then it's very possible, in fact probable, that I'm leaning not on my understanding of God's Word and what God wants. I'm leaning on my opinions. I'm leaning on what I think the world is like and what the world should be like. And so I go to God's Word. For example, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, All Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Just look at how this verse, first of all, elevates the idea of correction and to say it's got to be done with God's Word. And when it is, when God's Word is open between the two of you and your, your correction focuses on the things that have gone wrong in the other person's thinking, according to God's Word, well then, at the end, they'll be fully equipped to do good works, every good work, which is what they're lacking in Crete, is what he said toward the end of uh, chapter 1 of Titus. All Scripture is breathed out by God, given to us by God, so that when we teach and when we instruct, when we rebuke and when we correct, we can have not our own standards, but God's standard. Question number four. What words can I use to make sure my tone is kind, patient, and gentle? Now, if you've heard my preaching for a while, you know I'm always trying to emphasize this. Why? Because I too often fail in this department. I want to be gentle. I want to be careful. But especially if I get in the mode of correction, I, I sometimes go too far. And we have to be reminded every time we speak to others, but maybe even especially if we're trying to correct them, we've got to approach this with kindness, with gentleness, with patience. Take a look again at 2 Timothy chapter 2. And the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but kind to everyone, able to teach, patiently enduring evil, correcting his opponents with gentleness. God may perhaps grant them repentance, leading to a knowledge of the truth, and they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil after being captured by him to do his will. Paul is saying, look, even when you're dealing with people who are in the category of rebellious, uh, you know, not wanting to listen to authority, what you've got to do, Timothy, and in the other case, Titus, is to approach things with gentleness, approach things with patience, because your goal is not just to correct your opponent. That's goal, that's sort of like, you know, a secondary goal. Your real goal, the underlying goal, is that they would be led to repentance, or that they would be led to a more accurate understanding of their relationship with God. As he describes here, perhaps God will grant them repentance leading to a knowledge of the truth. That's the goal. And finally, question number five. Is my correction understandable and persuasive? Now, in some ways, you'd think this is where we would begin. Because when you see an error happen or you hear an error happen, you're, you're, quickly, you're quick to think, okay, this is the problem, and here's how I need to deal with it. This is the, this is the, the clear answer to this problem. The thing is, though, you've got to go through all those other questions first. You've got to stop and think, wait a minute, is what I'm thinking here, what I'm about to say, is it worth the potential embarrassment? Is, is there scripture that's going to come into this conversation? Uh, am I doing this privately? Am I using kind words, gentle words? If all those things are yes, well now, yes, now is the time to be precise. Now is the time to deal with a specific problem. Because if we're not specific and understandable, well, then somebody might just get the impression that, uh, you, you know, you disagree with them overall, or you disagree with them generally, or you're somehow maligning their character. It's got to be exact. It's got to be understandable. It's got to be persuasive. Uh, sometimes people are not ready to hear it, and that has to be part of this question as well. When I say that something is understandable 
and something is persuasive, I have to have the audience in mind. I have to be thinking, is the person I'm speaking to ready to hear this? Or are there other factors that are going to cause this to go off the rails? Let's take a look at Proverbs chapter 9, starting in verse 8. Do not reprove a scoffer, or he will hate you. Reprove a wise man, and he will love you. Give instruction to a wise man, and he will be still wiser. Teach a righteous man, and he will increase in learning. We looked at this passage only a few weeks ago saying, yeah, that's the person I want to be. But notice that a scoffer, if you try to correct a scoffer, they're not going to understand and they're not going to be persuaded. And you know what the result's going to be? They're going to hate you. This proverb suggests that you've got to be very careful. You have to ask yourself the question, is this person in the right frame of mind to receive any kind of correction from me? It may be the subject matter. It may be their situation in life. But some people at some moments are simply not ready to hear any kind of correction. They're not ready to receive it. You could offer it, but they may scoff and end up hating you. You could offer it, and they could end up simply not listening and plugging their ears, as we looked at a scripture last week. But we, as God's people, must continue to try when it's that serious. Because there's some out there who are wise and who will love you for the correction. We don't usually think in those terms. We usually think that you know correcting somebody is never my job, as I mentioned at the beginning. But here in Scripture, it says, look, when it's called for, when it's that important, when it's that serious, offering correction can actually increase the bond of that relationship. We're always supposed to be trying to persuade people if especially their, their thinking is taking them away from who God is and what he's done in Christ. That's where we want to cultivate relationships so that we can be heard. Paul is always in this mode. He's always ready to persuade the next person to come in, to be, uh, become a Christian. Take a look at uh, Acts chapter 26. He's speaking to King Agrippa. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know that you believe. And Agrippa said to Paul, in a short time, would you persuade me to be a Christian? And Paul said, whether short or long, I would to God that not only you, but also all who hear me this day might become such as I am, except for these chains. So Paul's message to Agrippa is, yeah, I want to persuade you. I want to correct your thinking. You believe in certain things, and I can connect the dots for you and show you the, the glory of the gospel in Christ. Yes, I want to persuade you. Yes, I want to convince you. Because right now, your thinking is off. But I want to get you on the right path that God has revealed to us in Christ. How do we correct somebody else? We have to ask ourselves these questions. Is the error so serious that the good of the correction outweighs the embarrassment of the correction? And if so, then is there any reason this correction cannot occur privately? What Bible passages will I bring into the conversation? What words can I use to make sure my tone is kind patient, and gentle. And then finally, is my correction understandable and persuasive? That's the lesson today. It's a lesson that simply says there are times when correction is not only necessary, but it can be a blessing. And so will we, as a church, help our brothers and sisters when that help is needed? Because to not help when the error is serious is to not love. It's to let somebody go. It's to let somebody go down a path that I know leads to, to destruction, leads away from Christ. And so I need to take action. How do I do it? I ask myself some of these questions. I prepare as God's servant, as somebody who's going to be speaking for God, so that there is a benefit to that person and the relationship that we have is strengthened. God is calling us to blessing upon blessing. Sometimes it's a risk that we have to take to step out and be able to help our brothers and sisters. This morning, maybe you are in the mode of somebody who needs instruction, who needs to get into God's Word, and maybe needs some of your, your thinking corrected and, and reoriented. We're here for you. Our contact information is at the end. Maybe today, as a Christian, you need to take action for one of your brothers and sisters. Well, I recommend going through every single one of these five steps so that you're ready, and God can help you, God can help them, and have that conversation be one that is mutually beneficial and upbuilding. 
Thank you for listening today. So long.